Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the Quantum X Index 1615, a universal bridge amplifier. Your microphones are going to stay muted throughout the presentation so that we don't have feedback for everyone. If you have questions, we'll address them at the end of the presentation using the Q&A feature of WebEx. However, you're welcome to type in your questions at any time. Our presenter today is Suzy Sasu. Suzy is HBM's Test and Measurement Business Development Manager for North America. He has a PhD in physics where his thesis focused on materials characterization. He has over 20 years experience in the data acquisition industry. Suzy, it's all yours. Thank you, Krista. Uh, welcome, everybody, for the Quantum MX 1615 Universal Bridge Amplifier web presentation. As Krista mentioned, my name is Sujit, and uh, I am the Test and Measurement Business Development Manager for HPM based out of uh, Marlborough, Massachusetts. Let me see if I can move my slide forward. Okay, so my agenda today includes uh, an introduction to the QuantumX uh, family of data acquisition products. So for those of you who are new here, uh, the QuantumX is a data acquisition product and family of products from HBM. And I'm going to focus specifically on the QuantumX MX1615 hardware, which was released uh, later last year, and talk in the details on the hardware, the software, the technology, uh, what are the benefits of offer, how to uh, use data acquisition through the various software interfaces it comes with. And at the end, I will discuss some of the applications and uh, we'll summarize the entire presentation. So I hope uh, it will be about 30 minutes and I'll be done. And then you can uh, ask me questions and we can have a discussion based on uh, any questions you might have. All right, so the quantum family of uh, data action products was released by HBM in 2008. So since then, uh, it has matured a lot, and there's a lot of installation of these quantum products out of the field in the laboratory, primarily used by engineers uh, in the data acquisition industry for lab tests or for field tests, as well as in operations for service monitoring and analysis. Um, it comes, uh, the Parliament family has a lot of different hardware modules available, and over the years we have released uh, quite a few of them, and it, we will continue to do so uh, as time progresses. But the most common ones that, that people really like are the universal input modules, uh, namely the 840A and the 440A, uh, which is uh, well known in the industry to take almost any kind of uh, sensors out there. It takes about 15 different types of sensors, so it's, it's a great tool for high mix uh, and uh, low volume, uh, low, ch low channel count or low channel volume type of application. But there are other modules available that does rotation and torque and vibration. These are high dynamic or uh, high bandwidth type of uh, module that will acquire vibration signals uh, up to 200 uh, kilosamples per second of sample rate. And then there are other modules that address uh, high channel count. Uh, the quantum MX1615 uh, falls in this category. We have released a 1601 before that was primarily targeted towards thermocouple or temperature acquisition type application, and now we have released a 1615, which is uh, geared more towards experimental stress analysis, uh, which is based on mostly screen gauge type of transducers. Uh, in addition, we have special modules available, such as a data recorder module called a C22W, uh, in case you did not want to use a computer or a laptop or a desktop. Uh, you could just pair one of the Quantumix DAC modules with the CX22 and can have a standalone system. Uh, aside from data acquisition, Quantumix also supports canvas modules for both inputs and outputs. And for real time or deterministic type of application, it also offers an EtherCAT gateway. The Quantumix modules are used in the industry primarily as a a device tethered to your PC using a laptop or a desktop using an Ethernet cable, uh, but there are also other architectures available, such as a rack mount architecture, as shown here. You can have up to nine different quantum modules rack mounted together. Uh, you also have some distributor architectures available, where we can take one, two, three, or any other cluster of such modules and connect them via Ethernet and then access all of these modules uh, from a desktop or laptop PC also on the net. 
And then, of course, uh, the very popular CX22W, which is the Windows embedded uh, computer, uh, runs Windows. You can run uh, various software on it, actually, uh, and then connect back and deploy it. As long as you have battery power, it will just uh, run on itself on a car data and broadcast all the car data over the Internet. So let's uh, look, uh, take a deeper, uh, take a deeper look into the 1615 module, which is the bridge amplifier. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of those modules uh, which has 16 synchronized inputs, and each, uh, each input, uh, each channel is individually configurable in terms of filter, bandwidth, and sample rate. Uh, this is the first module we have that offers both uh, DC and AC citation on every channel. We can select on one channel a DC citation, another channel an AC citation, or more commonly known as CF or carrier frequency citation. That's the more uh, technically correct terminology. Um, it supports full bridge with a six or four wire technology, half bridge, as well as quarter bridge with two, three, or four wire technology, and uh, 120 and 350 ohm completion resistors, as well as an internal shunt resistor of 86.6 kilohom. Aside from voltage measurement, which can be unipolar, uh, 30 volts max, or bipolar, plus minus 10 volts, you can also do measurement of resistance in four wire mode, as well as temperatures. As with any quantum modules, it supports 24-bit uh, resolution on the digitizer, the ADC, as well as a uh, .05 accuracy class, which is the worst case, which means uh, our accuracy measurements are much better than .05. And if you have a text-compatible sensor, you can just plug in directly into the module uh, and, and start acquiring data. Connectivity wise, is connectivity wise, it comes by default with the Phoenix pushing type of connector, like you see in the picture over here. But we also have ruggedized versions, such as the OU plug connector, like you see here, as well as RJ45 uh, available. What are the benefits of Quantum X1615? It is the most compact module channel density device available in the market that supports free and gauge type of applications. So uh, what I mean is there's 16 channels in one, one unit and 16 different screen gauges or screen gauge type transistors in one unit. That's pretty good. Uh, but more importantly, it is designed for applications where you encounter electromagnetic noise or any type of interference, uh, either in the laboratory or out of the field. And you can use this carrier frequency citation or more commonly known as AC citation uh, to tackle those noise and interference issues. And I'm going to spend a few minutes in the inducting slides to discuss that. Uh, in addition, the amplifier of the Quantum X1615 uh, also has a uh, built-in uh, compensation against the thermal drift or poor cable installation. So if you have an installation where the cable is jiggling or some mechanical vibration is available or some bad wiring has been done or over time wires have been creeping away, uh, this uh, amplifier has built-in intelligence to take care of those issues and give you the actual signal. Um, as is with other quantum uh, module, this module also enjoys the AutoCal feature. Uh, for, so for long term, a long time and long term measurements, where temperature drift is a dominating factor, using the AutoCal feature, you can uh, balance it out. So it has some drift compensation built in. So let's take a deeper look into the 1650 hardware. Uh, the 1650 hardware is currently in use in various applications for strain. Uh, for example, for laboratory, the laboratory type of measurements, uh, they are being used for the wind blade uh, application testing for strain measurements, plastic parts testing, uh, gas pipeline, uh, or other types of pipeline, bowls, concrete, and medical uh, applications for spine as well as satellite technology. Uh, for strain measurement applications in the field that are being used in uh, various uh, uh, helicopter or aerospace type of material blades, aircraft wing, um, road load data acquisition, uh, marine industry, train bogey, train railroad track, as well as automotive engine parts. So let's talk about measurement and noise. I mean, noise is out there everywhere, and, and a lot of times you are working in a nice environment where noise is not a dominating factor. But if you look around, if you're doing measurements by power lines, by AC generators, or motors, by wind turbines, uh, 
by, by railway tracks where high voltage lines are running. They all have various sorts of noises that is out, uh, out in the air and will be creeping into our measurement. So this is a nice chart that shows noise density over frequency. And I've got the thermal electric voltage and drift at DC uh, frequency, the 50 hertz, 50 hertz uh, power line, power line noise, and you have the 225 hertz and 5 kilohertz noise is coming out in generators as well. So all of these are going to affect your measurement. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how the carrier frequency excitation helps you overcome such uh, noise and interference issues in the measurement. And then the second thing we're going to talk about is uh, those uh, asymmetric influence on strain gauge cable using installation challenges. A loose cable or a mechanical vibration where you have mounted your strain gauges, uh, how do they affect your measurement and how do you overcome them? And of course, uh, the only present, the temperature and stability, low temperature and high temperature affects uh, on your measurement system. So this is a, this is a nice chart that shows uh, how a DC-based excited, uh, excited amplifier uh, deals with noise. If you have, and look, I'm showing you voltage versus time here. If you look at your blue signal, which is the actual train signal coming out of your uh, transducer, and then I have a magnetically induced noise, such as the ones we talked about. Uh, this is the magnetically induced noise, the green signal. Of course, the noise in this case is a little exaggerated and shows the bigger than the signal, but that could be the case uh, in some situations depending on how close the noise is towards your measurement system or how far away it is. Uh, if it's too far away, then the magnitude of the noise is going to be low. If it's close enough, then it's going to be high. So nonetheless, the signal to noise ratio in this case is not going to be perfect, and, and you will have to find ways to overcome it because once you amplify the signal and read out, the red signal is the actual output the amplifier reads. And if you look at the blue signal and the red signal, you know, the red signal does not really show the actual uh, signal that you're trying to occur in the first place. So there's no correlation either in amplitude or in phase with the acquired signal. So you couldn't even go ahead and correct for it. Now, if you look at a carrier frequency technology, uh, in a, as, as, as compared to a DC excited technology. A DC excited technology uses an amplifier which is very wide in, in bandwidth. So it acquires everything within the bandwidth of the, uh, of the amplifier. Whereas in the carrier frequency based technology, the bandwidth is not reduced. Uh, in a reduced bandwidth situation, everything that is not your signal, all the unwanted signals now fall outside of your bandwidth and hence they are being rejected. So for example, if you look at this plot here, uh, the, the number one is the thermal electric voltage and drift. Number two is uh, power line frequency. Again, three is right on DC amplifier offset drift. And other noise voltages, four, five, six, seven, etc. And the way carrier frequency technology works is that uh, your actual signal, strain signal, is mixed uh, with a carrier frequency, in this case, 1200 hertz uh, square wave for 1615. And then it's fed to the amplifier. The amplifier would then do its magic, and then it will go to your bandpass filter, and the bandpass filter will reject everything outside of the signal, and then it will do the demodulation of it. The demodulation takes out the carrier frequency, and then you apply a low-pass filter to get your actual string signal. And when you do so, I, I'm going to plot the same exact graph now. You've got the blue line, which is your actual signal. You've got the green line, which is your interference. And then you've got your dashed red line, which was a DC measurement amplifier. But now using carrier frequency technology, the, the solid red line, you can see, it is right on top of line riding with, with the actual signal. So yes, there's a little bit of phase shift, but the amplitude of the measurement that you're doing is right on. So that gives you the best accuracy, because you, you, if you're measuring the right signal uh, at the right time at the right voltage level. Uh, a practical example of using um, a, a full bridge bending beam using DC excitation and AC excitation. So we have got a, a solenoid, which is a, the noise generator, and I've got a few strain gauges here, all in full bridge mode, and I'm basically moving this solenoid back and forth to the measurement time. And some of the solenoids, one of the solenoids here is using DC excitation, and the other one is using a carrier frequency or AC excitation. If you look at the DC excitation signal as acquired by the amplifier, 
you have a lot of noise in here, and this is not a true representation of the train signal. But if you look at the AC citation or carrier frequency citation, it's a flat line. And that takes the noise interference out of the equation. The second thing is the symmetric influence on strain due to, uh, due to bad cabling or installation challenges. Uh, and so what we did was we took three different transducers, one in four two-wire mode, one with three-wire mode, and one with four-wire mode, all with DC citation. And uh, we then did the, as you see in this picture, you know, kind of jiggle the cable to simulate real-world mechanical vibration or bad cabling or other influences uh, from the environment. And if you look at it in a two-wire mode, uh, there, there is a lot of noise in the signal. In a three-wire mode, which is a black line here, also a lot of noise in the signal. Whereas in the four-wire mode, it's a very good representation of the signal. So despite of all the challenges of installation, the blue line here gives you the best representation, and hence the four-wire configuration works out very nicely. So that's something we also recommend. Um, using a four-wire configuration over two or three-wire, you're going to get the best results when you have challenging situations faced uh, during the measurement time. Now, let's, let's sort of the last thing that influences the measurement is thermal instability. If you have, you're working in a room temperature environment, this is obviously not a factor. But over time, if you're working in a harsh environment, where we are simulating a harsh environment of temperature using a heat gun here, and we have taken the same three transistors in the previous slide, the one in two-wire mode and three-wire one in four-wire mode, and if you look at it, the two-wire has a maximum drift, three-wire has a little bit drift, and the four-wire has almost no drift. Using the four-wire mode, you, you can overcome thermal instability. So the suggestion is use four-wire configuration whenever possible. And depending on your interference issues, noise and interference issues, use AC citation whenever possible. So here's a heat chart that basically shows when to use what to kind of give you a guideline, uh, it's sort of a guideline here. I've got three different mode here, the DC excited mode of 1615. Uh, the square wave AC excited mode or carrier AC excited mode of 1615. And then we have the 848, which is not a part of today's discussion. Uh, that uses a pure sine wave at 4.8 uh, kilohertz. Another carrier frequency amplifier. So if you have electromagnetic noise, both the carrier frequency and base amplifier will do a good job. Whereas you may have to do a strong support conditioning uh, for the DC excited base amplifier or have, find out other ways to deal with it. Uh, if you have some enough to drift um, influence, again, the carrier frequency based amplifier will work out great for you. However, if you have long, long cable emissions from the sensor or transducer to the data acquisition devices, then the cable influence will, will set in the capacity effects of cable. And at that situation, a DC excited amplifier will be point blank the best solution. However, if the cabling is done right, which is using twisted pair cable, proper shielding, etc., then the AC excited or carrier frequency excited based amplifier are not so bad. Uh, here's a resistive type transducers. Uh, you cannot use, use a AC excitation there. And for inductive type of transducers, such as LVDT, uh, you do need a pure sine wave based uh, based excitation, and the 840A is only for work. So to achieve the best possible law of accuracy and repeatability, uh, it is suggested that you use carrier frequency based excitation when possible. Not here, but those places, yes. And use the four wire mode uh, of, of connecting the transducers also when possible. The 1515 software. So what are the different software layers available to help you talk of this device to do data acquisition? Uh, for those of you who have been using the Chronomix modules, you already know that it comes with the Chronomix system for free. Uh, and in addition, we also sell, as you can also sell, the CatNet and three different versions of the CatNet Easy APN Enterprise, which is a completely free package software, and all you do is point to and do type of acquisition. It does way more than what the Chronomix system can do. And then for the, 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 the guys who like to program a lot, we also have drivers for LabVIEW, data and Canopy uh, to talk to quantum assistant. All three software layers will have straight connection, direct connection to a uh, quantum driver. There's also uh, a web browser available, which only shows you the status. You can't really program anything here. And then also custom, custom software protocol available, such as .NET or Chrome-based uh, interfaces. 
So here's a corner of the system, which is basic and easy. You open it up. It goes on scans your network. In my case, you found my corner of 1515. Uh, define some channels with AC citation and DC citation uh, from the full bridge. And you need to found everything. Um, and I have the options of looking at test based signals as well. If I have test based transducer, uh, I can go ahead and look at a sensor database and define more sensors if I choose to do so. I can view offset it. Uh, I can clear any information out there through sensor adaptation. So it's, it's a basic tool and that does the job right. Uh, but if you need more than that, uh, excuse me. Uh, if you need more than that, you will probably have to move into CatNet. And CatNet is a more exhausting interface. It's more complete. Uh, it gives you the options of defining your channel, uh, defining your data acquisition job, and gives you options of visualization, which is uh, not as fancy in the corner of the system, but here you can go really fancy. It also has the same uh, sensor database access to you, and also computation channels, which is our virtual uh, map channel you can define here. In addition, it also offers you scripting using VD scripting, so you can do custom uh, look and feel of your interface. So here you're looking at uh, my setup. Uh, I was using a different module yesterday, the 840, for example, and uh, I, I was looking at 840 and all the sensors and the styles of the sensors. Some of them are uh, having a CAN module connected to it, the 840 CAN talk to CAN modules, and others are using, you know, standard uh, screen based type of sensors. So the steps of doing data acquisition, no matter which way you do, whichever tools you use is the following. Uh, you go to the sensor database and select a sensor, or you define your own custom sensor. I'm going to show that in the next slide. Or use a test-based sensor. This is the easiest way to do it. And if you have a test tube in a sensor, you just plug and play, and you're up and running. Then you can define your channel configuration, such as sample rate and filters, and uh, and then you can do measurement job and definition of triggering, synchronization, when to stop and start and stop, where would you like to store the data in a network or locally in the file. And of course, the visualization interface, which offers the standalone mode and interactive mode and various types of displays. So here's an example of my sensor database that I defined for the 1615. I, 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 I took a wing sensor and I put the details of the wing sensor. And then I went to the transducer characteristics option where I told them what is the electrical to physical uh, characteristic of this transducer. In my case, the sensitivity of this transducer was 3 millivolts per volt. It is a data sheet, and it's a wing sensor, so it has a maximum of 2 kilograms it can measure. And then I, 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 I also define my citation by clicking on the setting here. Here's the setting picture. I define my citation to be 5 volts at a 12 megahertz carrier frequency because I'm using 1515. Uh, similarly, I define another channel. Uh, so I've, 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 I've shown you two different sensor settings here. One is with AC excitation, one is with DC excitation. Uh, once you define the channel of the sensor, you can drag and drop. Similarly, you can drag and drop. And now you can hit the start button and it will start doing your measurement. That's uh, using CatMap. Uh, when you hit the, you can, you can also configure your, you know, your, your, your sample rates here, 50 hertz or 2400 hertz, or your triggering options if you decide to do so in this process. And then your visualization screen pops up. You can, you can tell Catman which type of visualization you want. You can only have charts and graphs, but you also have other sources of this available for your help. If you're a lab view programmer, you would uh, you would be familiar with the screen. If you are using National Instrument Data Action Devices, you can uh, offer the same type of architecture. You've got a system set of BIs. Uh, I can I can talk. To, I can initialize my data action device. I can connect to it. I can disconnect from it. I can end the DAC uh, DAC project here. I can I can I can get information on sensors. I can set information on sensors. Here are the different sensors available, sensor class, LBDT, you know, turn, bridge, voltage, et cetera. You can do scaling on them. You can define a, a group for data acquisition, when to start and stop the job, how often to update. Same thing for the sensors you can do for canvas devices, and you have a bunch of examples that ships uh, so that you have to start from scratch. You can just pick one of the examples and be up and running. So I chose one of these examples here called the Quantumix Multi-Devices Tab BI. And I run it, it goes and finds all the quantum devices connected to our laptop in the, in the Ethernet cable. It finds the 1615, and I have defined three channels over there, and I hit the back star and drop, and as I was wiggling my transducer, it was reporting my data, basically. Uh, for dot type of application, you have the same thing. 
you have get you know same thing as LabVIEW, um, and you have you have uh, the get available network adapters. Uh, you know, go to scan the one of modules, uh, look at look at different channels, at the device configuration, look at the sensors, start a measurement, start a measurement, uh, and of course the last but not the least, the web browser interface. In case you are not sure if you are connected to the one of module, just type in the IP address in the web browser, and this will pop this up. And for me, it pops up with all 16 channels. Letting me know that I have one AC sided channel, one DC sided channel, one four one more channel, etc. Application. Um, applications for Quantum Net, uh, like with any device and devices, are governed by the sensors you connect to the excitation of the bandwidth performance of the sensor. Uh, the connectivity, there is pushing type or OD type, the military type, the RGA type. The access requirements, uh, 0.05% seems to be a very common one. Environmental conditions, harsh, thermal, of course, the weather of reactions such as EMI, mechanical, etc. So, using the 1615, the experimental stress analysis seems to be the most common application out there. We are going to have a webinar next week, uh, I think. You can check on the HPM website uh, and details of experimental stress analysis. But uh, basically, experimental stress analysis involves uh, the stresses determine the involves the stress versus strain plot. The stresses are determined by applying measure strain, strain to the characteristic values of the material. And then time synchronized measurements are on various kinds. This is like force and temperature, and different data is collected. Examples of wind tunnel type applet testing, you know, in wind tunnel type of testing, it can be an airplane, a model airplane, you know, a skier, a biker, or a car. Uh, you use load cells to measure force or drag at various positions, and you may use strain gauge to measure parts of the strain. In this case, the big fan, the generator of the wind, is also a source of the noise, by the way. In some cases, depending on installation, and you may have to overcome that. So 1615 is ideal uh, with this care frequency technology uh, to overcome and this noise interference issues. In the service industry, people like the 1615 because uh, you can put all of them in one box with a large number of channels. You can put, take the transistors with you. With you. Um, most people like to take temperature type transistors, some voltage and, uh, and, and strain gauge rosettes, uh, four to five times of strain gauge rosettes, and they hook up to a laptop and off they go in the field. They open the laptop, start to measure with the Catman or, uh, or any other software of their choice, and they can acquire data and come home. So this is uh, very, very handy for service guys. Uh, in the railway industry, when there's a lot of noise interference, as the picture in the end of the show, uh, power line arcing uh, and then high voltage pick of force measurements is a big one out there. Uh, train measurement of train bulky frame uh, and track measurements are also big. And the, and the railway guys inevitably use uh, tariff frequency excitation for this because you really will have more challenges using DC type excitation in terms of such harsh today. Um, other applications are electronic board testing, that's uh, given. Uh, RFI built in the electric, in any electronic board, and uh, if you try to do strain measurement on the electronic board, a PC board, for example, uh, there, and while it's powered on, of course, uh, you will have uh, RFI influence in your measurement. Electrical power lines testing, the one, the high voltage line that's running from the power station or power generating station to distribution centers all over the world. Uh, automotive engine, aerospace engine, uh, medical device like spinal cords, um, sports, uh, medicine, chassis, and frame type of testing like bike frame or bicycle frame. And of course, you can plug in your application here. If you choose to do a DC amplifier, you know, make sure you study the surroundings and, and take appropriate steps to overcome any noise and interference or bad cabling or thermal drift type of issues. Uh, but if you don't really want to deal with all that and you just want to plug and play, uh, use the 1515 and just connect and measure. To summarize our presentation today on Quantum X 1515, it is the most compact um, a module available that supports various bridge based applications, temperatures and voltages with full half quarter in the 3 to 6 watt technology. Um, it is very well suited for noisy environments uh, using uh, carrier frequency type excitation when needed. And it has a high channel density with a low cost per channel. In this case, 16 channel per module, and I think that for the U.S. price is around 450 U.S. dollars per per channel or something of that nature. But check with your sales, uh, local HVM sales, of course. 
He has a privation built in. It is uh, it can be centralized or distributed, distributed in terms of scalability, and uses MTP or firewall type synchronization. Firewall will give you microseconds level synchronization, and MTP will give you milliseconds level synchronization uh, between channels. So the channels and channels too can be really managed well. Uh, it has easy connectivity of sensors. It uses the Phoenix uh, push and time, push and type sensors, but uh, you can use other clients as well, like uh, the ODU type or the RG45 type. Uh, it is primarily used to, uh, to measure, uh, do experimental stress analysis, and do field as well as lab measurements. So uh, with this, I'm going to stop now and open up our discussion to questions.